Since I last saw the thing on my porch, things have been gradually getting quieter, to the point there's been absolutely no activity at all. No knocks, no porch lights on, nothing. Until tonight, no more than 30 minutes ago. So tonight was pretty boring. I was downstairs playing Pokemon Shield. It was already dark out, and my gym and puggle was asleep on my legs. I'm playing when I feel the dog who was sleeping suddenly stir from her sleep and then tense. I looked to her. She had an odd look on her face. I best associate it with confusion. When I follow her line of sight, she's looking into the adjoining office. Her eyes on the filing cabinet next to the desk that obscures a small area where we store a few things. Unsurprisingly, there isn't anything there. I was going to go back to my game, assuming that it was one of my cats, when she jolts to her feet, standing over me. Her head low, and now looking very unhappy. Not growling yet. But quickly, she tenses more, and starts growling this whole time she's looking over to the filing cabinet, where there's still nothing. She's a very passive dog. She never growls, and especially not at our cats. She always just wants to play with them, but they're never receptive to these desires. Suddenly, she looks over towards the hallway next to the office, which leads into a storage room, formerly a playroom. And the bedroom for my father when he worked in the ER. As well, this was the only room with access to the crawl space through a hole in the wall, which was closed and locked with a wood panel. As I looked, I didn't see anything, but I felt... I don't know how to describe what I was feeling. I want to say it was malice, but I don't know what this feeling was. It was intense and just bubbling out of the room like a torrent for what felt like a good minute. And then it was gone as quick as it started. I was very shaken, but got up and grabbed this old Navy submarine sabre. A family heirloom, and despite its age, an effective weapon. And sort of something I take great comfort at having nearby. I went looking. I wish I found my cat or something like a rat, but there wasn't anything at all until I came back to the main room and made a very manly whimper. The porch lights were on, and I can assure you they weren't ten seconds prior. I go outside to look around. There isn't anything, but the broom that was beside the light switch is on the ground, broken in half. It was an old wood one, so breaking it would have been no trouble but I'd used it for hours earlier when I left it there. I looked around and got the feeling of, I guess, malice again, but this time it was from the surrounding area. I went back inside when I discovered the door was locked, and not the simple lock. The stiff deadbolt had been turned. I instantly thought the worst as I heard my dog barking, despite being unable to see anything through the windows. I assumed someone had to have been in my house. I pulled out my phone and began moving to the upstairs patio door and calling my father, who was upstairs the whole time. The way my dad tells me when he answered, I didn't sound scared. I sounded pissed. As I told him that someone was in the basement. I throw open the back door seconds later, a sabre in hand storming towards our basement. My mother and father were clearly confused but concerned, and my father followed me as my mom began to call the police. We get down there, and my puggle has been joined by my lab, who were both barking, clearly angry, directing towards the back storage room. I stormed back there, sabre ready to stab some intruder. When I got back there, my heart sunk as I saw a familiar wood panel. It was the crawl spaces. One that had a mysterious habit for years of ending up on the floor over the years, with other weird stuff involving the crawl space itself. My dad and I pull out our phones and begin shining our lights inside the hole. Inside is maybe five foot room floor to ceiling with an uneven dirt floor. There's nowhere to hide and nowhere to go. I end up leaving as that feeling is lingering and making me start crying. Maybe the shock of it all hitting me. I explain to my parents through tears what happened. They were unsure what to think, but thought, thought several things were too weird to blow off. But we didn't know what to do. A couple of hours go by, 
as I talk about it with my parents. But it got late, and when I was about to go to bed, I was going back downstairs to grab my charger. I went to flip on the light switch, which had been bright and strong not long before, and then that feeling of malice came back. It wasn't as bad, but when I looked downstairs in the dark, I felt something staring back. I stood there just soaking it in, having a staring contest, wondering if I really needed my charger, and just felt like going down there right now was an awful idea. So I went back to my room, just staring at my door, shaking slightly. I feel insane, because this time there really wasn't anything I saw. Just feelings, and I can't stand that I want something more physical. Something that I can cling on to. My dad's a doctor. He's drilled into me a need for physical evidence from the things I see. Tonight, all I have is a bad feeling. So I don't know what to do. I needed to talk about this and I need some verification to myself. I didn't just lose my mind. I'm scared. More scared than before. Because I don't know if it's the figure from before. Has it gained a way in? Was I wrong in believing it wasn't hostile? Is this thing in my house listening to me? Okay, I need to stop this. Speculating like this is just making me go insane. I need sleep, but like hell I'm turning the lights off. I feel like a 10 year old again, being afraid of the dark, but I don't care too much. The train whistle is blowing again tonight. That goddamn train whistle. I'd lived on my rural acreage for 20 years when I got the letter from the county that they were planning on running a rail line through the easement next to my house. When I had moved in, the easements only allowed for the power and gas companies to run their pipes to my house and the neighbours. But I guess the county voted to change it at some point and I had missed the memo. I like my peace and quiet. Myself and some neighbours got together, presented a case that the county failed to communicate properly and got the whole thing tied up in the courts for a few years. Then we ran out of money. Damn railroad bled us dry. They could afford to. Someone told the media and they blew it out of proportion for us. Lots of voices got raised about the county screwing residents, a number of which served this country in their younger years. The county agreed to vote on it and agreed to put construction on hold pending further review. Then they quietly pushed it through as an emergency measure. They said the county needed the money from the railroad to help because revenues were low. Poorest county in the state, the town paper said. The construction was bad enough, with the banging of the diggers and dozers of men in orange jumpsuits hammering in the spikes. But I had survived it once, and could survive it again. I could sleep. The trains, though, kept me awake. The construction stopped at night. The trains ran like clockwork. They shake the house, as if you were set up at a camp for a day's march behind the front line. We pleaded with the county to stop running the trains after sunset, but our pleas fell on deaf ears. We arranged protests, but they broke us up, and broke us down. We relented. Most of us gave up. Not all of us, though. Nine of us had lived through it once, and didn't want to live through it again. The first one we got was a coal freight. We hit it mid-train. The fuse for the dynamite was cut too long. Still, the railroad cleaned up the mess and repaired the track. The cops asked around, but no one really knew who did it. Could have been anyone. The second one was grain, which caused a big fire. We still didn't have the fuse timing right to hit an engine, but we were causing way more damage this way anyway. The railroad had to pay the county for putting out the fire, and it was a big bill. They fixed the track again. The third one hit a bunch of empty cars and barely damaged the rails, but the president of the railroad came to the county hall and threatened to move the railroad out of our no-good county if it happened again. The fourth one was hauling logs. They had that one cleaned up pretty fast, but they repaired the track. The trains continued. Apparently the line was too profitable to close. The fifth train 
was a mistake. They had never sent a passenger train the night before. We had heard it was supposed to be another coal train, so we tripled up on the dynamite. 136 people. We were done. They won. A few guys took the easy way out. They didn't have to live with it. It came around every year, the dam whistle blowing, and every year, another of us put a gun barrel to his temple. The first time I didn't connect the dots, I thought it was just me imagining things. When I read the obituary, it started to come together. That's okay though, dates can bring up memories. The second year it happened though, I knew I wasn't the only one bothered to hear that whistle. It's been nine years today, and I hear that whistle blowing. It's getting closer. It's true what they say though, they save the worst for last. It came out a few days later that the president of the railroad had given orders to delay a passenger train earlier in the day and gave it a special order for a midnight run to make up time. He knew how to beat us. The courts said there wasn't enough evidence though to let him go free. Funny thing though, the railroad didn't rebuild that line. They took it out of the county and ran through the next one over. It's been quiet, except for that damn whistle once a year. On pleasant summer evenings, I like to go on walks through the cemetery after work. Some find it to be a somber and even frightening place, but I find it to be a pleasant way to clear my head. I also don't mind the occasional conversation with a ghost here and there. I was having just a stroll one afternoon this past summer. It had rained earlier in the day, but the sun was now shining and the air was crisp and clean and filled with dew. The spectres and spirits populating the place must have appreciated it as well, because they were all out enjoying the day as the living would. Most don't see ghosts, and many of those who do are immediately frightened, but I was all friendly nods as I made my way through. The dead sometimes regard this behaviour as odd, but most were quite welcoming and returned my friendly gestures. Towards the centre, at a large statue of an angel, I saw a group of children playing as they would have at the park on a day like that. It's sad, of course, to see these children and know that their lives had been cut short. But I found it inspiring as well to know that they weren't missing out on childhood play and fun. I watched for a moment, reminded of my own children when they were young. It was then that I noticed another child standing far back among the graves, watching sullenly at the others. I approached him, knowing that sometimes children gang up and exclude others, and resolve to help this little spook out. Hello there, I said. My name is Thomas. What's your name? Mitchell. Mitchell Higgins. His tone was as sad and wistful as his face, and even sadder, with the injuries from life that had followed him into death. The name struck me as familiar, and I tried to remember if there had been any incidents involving children in the area recently. What are you doing over here all by yourself? I asked. Won't the other children play with you? No, he said with a frown. Well, maybe I should go speak with them. Perhaps I could ask them to be kinder to you. No, they never play with me, ever. His voice was filled with resolve, and being a parent, I knew my involvement could do more harm than good. So instead, I decided to keep him company for a bit. We watched as the other kids ran and jumped and goofed around the statue. They all wore their funeral clothes, and some also carried evidence of their own mortal wounds. Burns, it looked like, and some rather badly. It didn't bother them, though, and they all played as though nothing at all was the matter. I, on the other hand, found myself uncharacteristically and increasingly uneasy. They were all mean to me when I was alive too, he said, with perhaps a frightening tone in his voice. That's terrible, I said. I hope they change their way soon. I doubt it, he said back. They're mad at me because I'm the one that started the fire that brought us here. Some things about me before I start, in order to understand. For generations, both sides of my family 
have been able to do weird things according to stories and experiences I've heard, and it's especially in women. It's stronger on my mom's side though. My dad's side is not so much. There's also schizophrenia running in that side, so many things I've heard could be that illness. I grew up with my dad's sister showing schizophrenia, and as a child, I was unofficially seen by a psychiatrist just because he was there for my aunt. And I had seen her breakdowns, so my dad worried about my mental health. One of those times, I heard the psychiatrist warn my dad about possibly having depression and anxiety, which I have been battling since I was eight. I'm in a better place with no medication for that. Yet, women in my mum's side of the family can and could see the dead in their sleep, had astral projected and saw car accidents or last moments of loved ones, saw entire days in the dreams, and we were raised to respect our ancestors just as much as the orthodox Christian saints. As for my dad's side of the family, there were claims of seeing precognitive dreams in the dead. I do believe the precognitive dreams because my sister and I have them, but the dead I'm sure it was schizophrenia. Now things get weird with me. I started showing signs a 10 year old child that no one noticed besides some grand aunts and my grandmas who warned me not to stand upon this and keep using my normal senses. They never taught me how to control or what it was. It was a known secret in the family. I was always told I acted older than I was. Then I started asking weird questions saying things before I could stop myself, and they later came true. The deja vu, the precognitive dreams, predicting that a woman I had known for mere days with three weeks pregnant before she knew it herself. I was told many times to be careful what I say, and when people learned I was born on Saturday, they would say that I should be careful. In Greece, being born on Saturday is to be gifted to curse others. Or at least that's what I was told when I pressed for more answers. After the grandmother of a classmate started to curse my name and family the moment she learned what day I was born and almost kicked me out of my friend's house. Then I learned that I was born dead and revived 20 minutes later. And on the same day, at the same time in the other side of Greece, my mum's dad suffered a stroke and flatlined for the exact amount of time. And the first words he spoke before falling into a coma were, I saved her, now she has to fight, to my aunt, his older daughter. When I learned that being born dead on Saturday was far worse, according to my great aunt, I stopped liking my birthday. Now, onto the main reason for posting. A couple minutes ago, I was watching YouTube, a video of Trey Kennedy, a comedian of sorts, when the word Moog came into my mind, but pronounced mom. Yet I saw the word mo. I instantly Google translated and the language it put me in was Sana. So I Googled the Cyprusian Arabic language if I translate it correctly from Greek to English. Never heard of that language before in my life. According to Google Translate, mo means bad and mom means cow. It's the third time something like this has happened but the second time with a word of a language I've never used before. The first one being the word sitna, which according to Google Translate, it means in the seat in Gujarati. I still remember my dad's look when I said sitna, just before I opened the kitchen cupboard. And you know what we were talking about? He had asked me where his folded clothes were, and soon enough, they were in the seat behind him. He looked confused and asked me what I said, and I turned and told him that I didn't know that it had just came out, and then pointed at the clothes and said in Greek, they're in the seat behind you. The third time was the word aboriginals, and I don't know why. What's happening? Why does it happen? In July, me, my sister and my mum's best friend who was visiting us for summer holidays decided to go for a walk around the town we were in. We lived near the main highway, so we started walking towards the highway and then planned to take the second left turn that would get us to some stairs that lead to the centre of town 
in half of the time it took you to go from the road. As we walked, I got the urge to look behind me at the garbage can, and I saw the smallest kitten following us while meowing and stumbling. Please note that ever since I was a baby, I was afraid of cats, dogs, and other pets, because as a baby, a chicken had stole my pacifier from my mouth, and I started chasing it to give it back to me, only for it to start chasing me in retaliation and scared me, and an old friend of mine when I was three trapped me under the bed with his terrified rabbit, making me scared to death, until his mum came and saved both me and the rabbit. So I kept my distance from pets, but this time I felt absolutely safe, and before I could bend over to pick up the kitten, my sister swooped in and grabbed it. I felt this intense wave of possessiveness come over me for the kitten, and I extended the hand to take it, but my sister refused, saying how it wanted her, not me. But I knew deep down, that was a lie. We took it home with us, and we named it Sudden, as in suddenly. We didn't know what gender it was. I pet it, and I had this strong feeling it was a he, and that he needed milk. I told my family, but no one listened until I went and prepared a bowl for him. The moment it was put before him, he started drinking with huge gulps and he fell face first into the bowl and I saved him. Then we prepared a home for him in our backyard. Around the afternoon, it started meowing and dad and I went to check on him and I bought water, having the same feeling that he needed it. Yet again, he drank all of it. I attempted to hold him, but I was afraid of my own strength and I was getting overwhelmed with fear, both mine and not mine. I was familiar with feeling emotions not my own, but somebody else's, but never with animals, and it was the first time I felt it with an animal. I played with him since he seemed to like my blue sleepers, and then Dad picked him up and cuddled him, Then I got to see his eyes. They were the same colour as mine, brown, greenish, and Dad saw it and commented on it. Then I told him that my sister lied about her finding the kitten, and that it was following me, not her. Dad said that it was weird, since most animals I've met feel my hesitation and keep away, but not sudden. I kept studying his eyes, and they felt so familiar, like I've seen them before. When I decided to sit down and hold him in my legs while petting him, I started humming a lullaby I've been singing to myself whenever I'm sad and afraid, and I had sung it in my dreams to the children I've dreamed of being a mother to when Sudden started to purr and cuddle closer to me. I was feeling overwhelmed with the need to hug him and protect him, when I decided that I'd close my eyes and take a few deep breaths, when Sudden's eyes came into mind, and at the same time, I recalled where I'd seen those eyes. A couple of years ago, I had dreamed of being a mother to twins, a boy and a girl. We had gone to the park when the boy fell and scraped his knee. He came crying to me, and I held him in my arms while soothing him. When he tilted his head towards me, and I looked into his eyes, and he asked me, Do you love me, Mama? And I said, of course, that I loved both him and his sister with all my heart, and I couldn't wait to meet them. His eyes were identical to Sudden's. Then I opened my eyes and suddenly looked at me, and I was crying. Then Sudden jumped off my lap to my dad, and I went to the bathroom where I broke down crying. A day later, construction started happening in our street, and the noise scared Sudden, and he ran away, never to be seen. I expected that I would cry and miss him, but for some reason, I know I'll be seeing those eyes again soon. It's May. And on the 17th, it will be six years since my maternal grandma passed away in her sleep. We rarely visit her grave because of many reasons. At first, it's because my mum was disabled and the rocky floor isn't safe for the crutches. And without them, my mum can't walk or stand. And now with gas prices and our monthly troubles, we think twice about moving the car. Anyways, I do feel guilty for not visiting, but if she conceals from wherever she is, I know she would understand and not judge us. 
I do think that all my grandparents, who are buried in various places all around my country, would understand why we seldom visit. My grandparents had many times visited me in my dreams, but I have to see them since 2020. Last I saw them was the day after my head injury. They visited me to check on me because my injury could have been deadly. After that, I never saw them, and I had two theories. One was that I was physically blocked due to my injury and the emotional trauma. And the second theory was that they crossed on, meaning that they went to a different stage of the afterlife, one that cuts this type of contact. I was sad, but I've made peace with it, because as I have my journey, so do they. I'll see them again when my time comes. Having made peace, as I said, I didn't expect to see anyone until I go to bed. Yesterday was a very hectic and busy day, and from stress, I didn't sleep until 8am today. That was when I had the dream. In the dream, I'm with a friend who's visiting the islands of Lesbos, currently in real life. And in the dream, we're visiting the island together, with me as the tour guide, since I lived there for years. We entered an Orthodox Christian monastery of St. Taxiercus in Madamamados in Lesvos. I was showing my friend around, trying not to keep people from exiting the church, since the service was done. When I was about to cross from one side of the church to the other, when I bumped into two older women. One woman was dressed in a colourful women's suit with a skirt instead of pants and the other woman was older in age and dressed in total black, including a headscarf, as it's traditionally worn when a woman grieves her husband. Only her face was uncovered. In that second, I apologised to both of them. The only woman that had stayed behind was the older woman in black, who walked at a slower pace. The moment our eyes met, I saw it was my grandmother. I grasped her shoulders, exclaiming her name, and then I hugged her so tight, saying I wouldn't let her go. She was cold to the touch, and I started crying. I told her how hard it's been, and how wrong she was about mine and my sister's generation. In real life, in 2016, a year before she died, she had seen how my mum and I were shocked with the various terrorist attacks in France and Belgium. Especially in the Brussels attack, we had family friends who were hurt during the attack. And one afternoon, I was watching the news with my grandma when she changed the channel saying she couldn't hear any more bad news. And we started watching a documentary about the Second World War. My grandma was a child during the war and always remembered how it was under Italian occupation and German occupation. When she told me that my generation and my sisters were lucky because we would never feel the pains of war and starvation, because people knew better than to repeat history's mistakes... I had disagreed with her, but she said she was right. We all know how she was wrong, unfortunately. Back in the dream, I was telling her that we were on the brink of a world war, and how scared I am. I felt her hugging me back, like when I used to hug her goodbye, and she would squeeze between my shoulder blades, and I felt her bones while hugging her, like I usually did. My grandma had lost so much weight, especially the year she passed away. I held on to her when I heard her voice in my head, but she never moved her lips like she always does whenever she or any other grandparent visits me in my dreams. But I can't remember word for word what she told me. I remember her telling me that I had to let her go now and go back to my friend and that we'll talk soon. When I complied and as I let out her in my embrace, I started walking towards my friend. When I remembered that this was a dream, and my grandma was dead. I rushed to look for my grandma, but I couldn't locate her through the crowd. Then I turned to my friend, and I apologised for leaving them alone for this long, and that I was talking to my grandma. My friend looked at me, as if I'd lost my mind, and said, You weren't talking to anyone. You were praying before St. Maria's holy picture. That's why I didn't bother you. Confused, I turned, and I was about to say that I was not when a small wind blew by and the smell of fresh baked lucumades made by my friend giddily grasped my arm and dragged me to the coffee shop next to the monastery where they were being sold. I woke up crying and my pillow was wet from tears. 
I was in a terrible mood, and I opened Instagram to tell my friend I saw her in my dreams. When I checked her Instagram stories, and she had indeed visited the monastery. I was frozen for a bit when I smelled my grandmother's perfume while I was in the bathroom getting ready to wash my face. That's why I think it wasn't just a dream about my grandma, but it was in fact the spirit of my grandma visiting me. I miss both of my grandmothers because I never got to say goodbye to either of them. And I always felt so reassured that I would see them in my dreams, but I don't know how I would cope if I stop getting visited by them. It's like I lost them again. Do you guys think this dream was a goodbye? It was around 5pm and I had just finished a Zoom interview for a job and I was preparing my plate for a late lunch. We had pasta with minced meat and tomato sauce and I wanted to add a bit more salt, pepper and sweet paprika to my plate. I grabbed the table versions which are in nice shakers but I changed my mind and put them back and I used the shakers we use when cooking. I finished with salt and sweet paprika and I grabbed the pepper. One moment the shaker is filled halfway and I see it and at the moment I have it in my hands and I shake it to pour some on my plate. Nothing falls and I open my fist to see the shaker empty. What the hell? I just blinked and turned around. I wasn't too tired or had anything happen to my vision. I'm 100% sure the pepper shaker was filled halfway, not empty. How can it be empty? I have experienced glitches in the past, but this? This quickly things change? Never. The shaker was made of glass and it was clean. Nothing on the outside that could confuse me. I asked my parents if the pepper shaker was empty and they said yes for a month now. And they use white pepper instead of black pepper. Or they use the mixed peppers to the food because the supermarket has a shortage of the black pepper we used since last month. Did I see into the past? Or a different timeline? Is this considered a glitch? Because I do consider it. Any other theories of what could have happened? My dad is the second eldest of four sons. And when my grandma was pregnant with them, they lived in this old house. The house gave my grandma all sorts of negative feelings and horrendous night terrors. For some reason, this large mature tree always seemed to be the focal point of her dreams. The spirit wanted her and my uncle gone, and they wouldn't leave. My grandma would hear creaking floors. She would see shadows all over the house. Heck, she once had a 40 pound bag of potatoes freeze solid in her pantry. Her pantry was in the centermost part of the house so nothing in there should have froze, and literally only the potatoes froze. The nightmares of my uncle and herself getting hurt started taking a toll on my grandmother's health. And keep in mind, at the time, my grandma was pregnant with my dad. One night, she had a dream where my uncle was literally found dead by this tree that factored into most of her dreams. And the dream highly hinted at bad things happening to my grandma and dad had they stayed. My grandmother had enough and took herself, my uncle, and moved out in short order. Nothing bad happened to them, but that house is something my grandmother never forgot. And she still recalled the dream vividly when she told me about it over 40 years later. And now sometimes we get spooked when we notice my grandma's spirit has come to visit. But at least we all know she means us no harm. Unlike the entity of the house from when she was a young woman. Last week, I was going to bed around 1.30 and I came out of the bathroom upstairs and had my AirPods in listening to Precious Jam. Then I heard voices from the bottom of the stairs and I was like, hmm, has someone broken into my house? So I went down and searched the house except my living room because that's where I thought the voices were coming from and I didn't have enough courage to go in yet. I searched and saw or heard nothing around the house. Now it's worth mentioning my house isn't small, like it's quite big and it's really old. 
It was an old military office, as I live in an old MOD garrison. Anyways, I walked into the living room, and then in the dark the voices stopped. I asked if anyone was in there, and got no response. Then the TV turned on and then off, and repeated this process three times more. Now I am no way a small guy, and I wasn't scared of a confrontation with another human, but whatever was in that room was not human, and not nice. The room felt unusually hot, and it's never hot in there. Then I proceeded to try and turn the TV off, and the remote wouldn't respond. Then I hit the remote, and it turned the TV off, but then the TV turned back on, switching the Discovery Channel, with the TV program saying, no, mid-sentence. Now I know this sounds fake and no one in my family believes me, and that's why I'm here to get some understanding. But unfortunately, this experience wasn't over. My old cabinet opened and then closed and it did it several times and very, very violently. At this point I left the room and wanted out as the room didn't feel at all welcoming. After this I went to bed and could still hear the voices that I was hearing before, but the voices were not readable. Anyway, in a last bid for peace, I went down and got a picture of my recently deceased relative and put it on my refrigerator. And I know it sounds stupid, but after that, I've had no such experiences. And my house feels safe again. I just want some sort of help or answers for experience because I've been troubling me and my girlfriend ever since. I'll give you a little backstory. From the ages of 20 to 25, I'm now 27, I worked in a very old nursing home that used to be a farmhouse or slaughterhouse in the 1800s. And it's in the middle of nowhere. I worked night shifts with my best friend and flatmate. There was one night where we were short staffed, so there were only me and my friend and one nurse. It's a 38 bed home at full capacity. There's an old side and a new side. Nurse is doing a sleep shift, so she's asleep on the new side of the building. At 2.45, we start doing our rounds, checking the residents. Me and my friend never leave each other's side. We're both terrified of the old side of the building. It just has a dark energy and heaviness, like someone sat it in your back. We start on the ground floor, working our way from the bottom end of the corridor to the top. Before going up the back stairs, we leave empty cups at the top of the corridor by the lift. Six cups. We make our way up the stairs, starting from room 11A, round to 18. We left room 15 till last, as we could go down the back stairs into the kitchen next to that room. We go in to check a resident and offer fluid and fill out paperwork. I'm standing by the bedside where my friend sat in the chair. Time check, 3.33. We both look at each other and make a silly, ghostly sound. I'll never mock again. I feel a cold breath in my ear and a dark growl. I freeze my friend, turning pale, as she sees the room get very dark around me. We both calmly exit the room. We take the back stairs down into the kitchen, right out the kitchen door into the smoking area, to process what the hell just happened. Neither of us know what to say. We had heard noises and stories from others, but laughed it off. We go back in to collect the cups by the lift. I shout at my friend to come see what I'm seeing. Six cups we left. There were four now. She opens the kitchen door to me, and one cup lifts up and is thrown down the corridor to meet the other two. I must tell you now, no residents on that floor were mobile, and only staff can access through the doors. We were the only staff there. The nurse is still asleep on the other side of the building. We walk down the corridor, collect the cups and go back into the kitchen. Put the cups in the sink and there's a flickering shadow like a moth around a light bulb. There is no moth in sight, no windows open. We went back to the sitting lounge where we waited for what felt like days for the morning. We haven't told many people this story as I know it sounds absolutely crazy. I never slept for a while, kept waking up having strange dreams, feeling dark energies around me. 
My boyfriend woke me up one night, shaking me and shouting at me, saying there was a tall woman with a hood hanging over me. He doesn't believe in anything like this and is very close-minded when it comes to these things. He was nearly crying with fear. Another dream I had was a sort of astral projection. I could see myself asleep and also see myself sitting on the floor at the bottom of my bed, with my head in my hands crying. I suddenly am back in my body being dragged out of bed by myself, reaching for my phone under my pillow to call my friend in her room when I wake up. I wake up with my phone in my hand, open on her contact. I put on all the lights and went into her room to sleep with her. I'm terrified of having another dream like that, and I now hate sleeping alone. Everything started when my brother and I were fairly young, around when I was six or so. My mother heard a metal-on-metal metal knocking below her at night. It was strange, because she said it sounded as if it were below the house, where we slept peacefully. She claims to have heard them many times at night when we were younger, and it started to stop as we grow older. However, after I was told this story almost two years ago, I went to bed and heard exactly what she did. It scared me so much that I had to sleep in the same room as her. My mother, brother and I talked about this the next day over lunch, after I heard the knocking. She and I tried to explain to him what we heard. Immediately, he shot up and remembered that in the woods behind our house, he and his friend found two closed bunker-like doors that go into the ground. We immediately went on Google Earth to find them and sure enough, he wasn't lying. What's really strange is that for years, there have been military helicopters and planes flying over our house and directly over the bunker doors, ever since my mom heard the sounds. As the years went on, she would hear the noise less and less, and we wouldn't see the planes and helicopters as often either. But for some reason, recently everything has been coming back. Both my mother and I heard the knocking, and there were planes that flew over us. We believe that there's a hidden government bunker underneath us, something from the world. Who knows what's down there? My dad doesn't believe any of it. To make matters even weirder, my boyfriend mentioned the fact that the train station is only a few minutes from our house. Perhaps they built it close by to ship supplies here via locomotive to build the bunker. It happened in early June. My grandfather had passed away a little over a few days ago, and in order to not make my grandmother feel alone, I slept with her for a couple of nights. Very often, I have problems falling asleep, and I happen to hear noises in the house, such as creaking, sometimes even footsteps and voices, but I've never given them much weight, always considering them as auditory hallucinations. That night, I fell asleep earlier than usual, only to wake up in the middle of the night disoriented. In my confusion, I saw a figure next to the bathroom door staring at us. I immediately panicked. At that moment, I thought that someone had broken into the house, one of my biggest fears. But at the same time, I thought that it could be the spirit of my grandfather, even if I immediately dismissed the thought. Because although I find these things interesting, I've always been a bit skeptical. I remember my dog was quiet. He slept, and it is said that animals warn if something is wrong. So I tried to calm myself by closing my eyes and telling myself that I was just imagining it. But when I opened it again, the figure was still there. I saw him approach the bed and sit on the edge. I felt the bed sag under his weight. He was looking at my grandmother who was sleeping next to me. I saw him take a breath and clap his hands against his thighs as you do in a moment of despair. I was totally panicked and closed my eyes again. I don't know how much time passed precisely, but when I opened my eyes again, I turned on the light as fast as possible, and no one was there. About a year ago, my boyfriend and I started having issues with shadow people in our apartment. It was really bad. We never had this issue anywhere else. 
and tried everything from the internet. Nothing worked. Most things just made it worse. And I started going prematurely gray from stress and lack of sleep. I was once in the bathroom brushing my teeth while my shirt was yanked from behind, then lifted up over my head and face. I've never before run out of a room due to fear, but I did just that. Anyway, it was a crazy experience, but we figured it out and now have next to no activity. If you're suffering like we did, feel free to reach out directly. I really wish we had someone to advise us when this thing was happening to us. Essentially, we eliminated dark corners and increased light sources overall. Burning cedar did help some. Finally, we were able to get a priest out to bless the apartment. We aren't Catholic and it did take months, but we figured it couldn't hurt. Had zero faith it would have an effect because praying, reciting rosaries all night, etc. did nothing. Took the priest all of 10 minutes to do his thing, but two days later, everything stopped suddenly. That was a year ago and still nothing. I literally just emailed the local churches, asked for a house blessing and waited for one to accept my request. I only received one response. I'm not religious at all, but did go to Catholic school for a few years, which made me think of reaching out. Something to try if you're desperate. This story features my grandmother that passed away around 2006. We weren't the closest. She didn't treat me the best, I'll say that. But we've since made peace when she came to me in my sleep on another occasion. She often visits me in my sleep for some reason. So I find myself in this apartment-like place with my grandmother and some unknown man I've never seen before. He was a white man, maybe six feet tall, slim build, little to no hair, just strands, with a solid coloured jumpsuit on. From my surroundings, this place where I'm at looks to be futuristic yet dystopian. Just really run down, like it's just not a safe area. Seems like a lot of crime happens here. Grandma and this man were talking about some place or planet far away, and the things they were saying didn't make sense to me. They were talking from a point of view that they've both been there before at the same time. As I'm standing there listening to their conversation, I'm trying to connect the dots and make it make sense, because you'd have to travel there by spaceship. It just didn't make any sense because as of now, we haven't even landed physical people on Mars. We're so far off from anything close to that happening. So I had a confused look on my face because what they were saying wasn't possible. My grandmother saw the confusion on my face. Then grandma looked at the white guy and said, you wanna tell him? The way she swung her head over to look at him, it was almost like, oh, the little small brain kid has no idea what we're saying. It's like we're speaking French like I was beneath them. He kind of let out a sigh a little, but was willing to summarize so I could get the basics of what they were talking about. He was trying to explain the propulsion system of the ships they used to fly in space and how it works and why we people on earth right now don't understand it. But it was almost like it was just too complex for our human brains to even understand the details of it. He's using all these big words that even the best scientists we have now wouldn't fully understand. He was saying stuff like comparing to what we have now and what they have. How our ships thrust out the back as theirs don't necessarily need to do that. A lot of stuff that I couldn't exactly grasp because it was so advanced it didn't make sense to me. He was trying his best to explain it and was being patient with me. He didn't get frustrated like I expected him to. He kept trying to just really couldn't retain the information, so we just moved on. As he's talking to me and explaining, I'm looking at his face, and one of his eyes was milky and large, the other smaller and had no pupil. He was a tall white guy, about early 40s. It looked like he'd been through some type of bad accident, like he'd been through a lot in life. Gave me a survivor slash vigilante type of vibe. And he comes off almost like anxious and always looking over his shoulder. Like he's just not safe and doesn't trust his surroundings. 
He starts looking at me hella weird and creepy, and he's peeping out of this sliding glass door he's standing in front of. He's looking out the glass frantically, like every 10 seconds. I'm not saying anything about it, I'm just observing him, like as if he knows something is about to happen. I'm really confused why he's acting like that, but I don't say anything about it, I just observe him. I don't want to be disrespectful and say something rude. All of a sudden, he sees something out of the glass door and he looks frightened. He's looking out the sliding door at something and all of a sudden, his eyes turn all white with no pupils. Then he backs away out the front door into the hallway of this apartment. Outside the unit, as if he's trying to control himself and not hurt anyone. I look out the sliding door, but I don't see anything. But I can feel this intense energy all around us, so something was there. It was evident that whoever or whatever he saw were bad creatures and not human. I didn't know this for a fact, but the energy I felt said this. I look back at him. He turns his attention back to me, and we also make direct eye contact. Then I'm immediately frozen, and I'm filled with complete terror. Whatever he was looking at outside has consumed his body and soul. Then he charges towards me. I try to scream, but I'm like paralyzed, and no screaming is coming out verbally, just in my mind. Then a big flash of bright white light happens. Then I'm almost slammed back in my body in my bed somehow. Heart racing like never before, my heart's beating so fast that it's making my chest physically hurt. I'm scared, sweating. Soon as I wake up from the terror and realized I was in bed, but still scared from what I had just experienced, and started questioning how real was that? What the fuck was that about? Just at a loss for words. Something told me in my head your phone is about to ring. A voice said it about three times over and over. Your phone is about to ring. I look over at my phone that was on the floor, about five feet away from me, and just like the voice said, ten seconds later, my phone starts ringing. My stomach dropped. I'm just at a loss for words. But I answered, it's some lady asking for someone named Willie. I don't know anyone by the name of Willie. The number wasn't saved. So I usually don't even answer unknown calls, but I just did this because the voice that told me it was about to happen. So I was curious. It's been a few months since this happened to me. I haven't told anyone. I've had many dreams and nightmares before, and when I wake up, I can easily conclude that that's what it was. This was something different. I've had relatives who have passed come to me in my sleep before, yet this doesn't fit in any of those categories. One of my sister's best friends, whom I had known since I was around 11, passed away in a car accident. We only had a two year difference in age, so I always hung out with them. I always really looked up to her and admired her for her quick wit and amazing sense of humor. As we got older, we would party all together as well, and me and her both smoked a lot of weed. I still do. I'm a lifer and I'm dedicated. Anyways, I was 20 when she passed and honestly, losing her affected me really deeply. I've always been someone who has had odd experiences and I feel I'm extremely connected spiritually. So I had a feeling she would visit me or show me she was near me in some way and boy, did she ever. Within days of her passing, she was fucking with me. Multiple times she would flicker my lights until I actually yelled for her to quit it and instantly no flickering. I'd be listening to music and this girl always switched it to her favorite songs. But the thing that really got me, she would retrieve my joint butts after I would toss them and bring them back to me. Two instances of this are my favorites. One time I had a friend of mine staying over and we smoked out on my front porch. I walked across my street and tossed it. Me and my friend would go upstairs to find my bed sheets drawn back perfectly, folded with the butts and a lighter sitting there. My friend nearly shit her pants. The second time, I was at her cousin's house. Her cousin was in the hot tub with three other friends and I stayed out and smoked. I went around the house and tossed the butt over the fence. 
I literally told the girls as I did that, that our girl was doing this to me and to wait for it because she would definitely show it off to them too. I sat for like five minutes and got the urge to look down at the table and there it was. All the girls were stunned while I just said, my typical girl, I love when you can join me for the ganja. I passed by her crash spot twice a day to and from work and blow her a kiss to heaven every time. So my workplace is a former injection molding factory in a fairly nice city. I've been working there for about four years and I can say almost conclusively that it's haunted. I've been the only person in that building many times, but I've never felt alone there. Whatever presence is there seems to be shy or slightly mischievous, as it only makes itself known around a lone individual. Here are a couple stories. One morning, I was making coffee in the kitchen when I saw out of the corner of my eye somebody walking into the kitchen. I pour my cup and turn around to give my good morning and nobody was there. I walked out of the kitchen, no one. Hi bay, no one. I checked the virtual login. I'm the first one there and at that time, the only person who had clocked in and out for 12 hours. The lead facility tech was clocked early one morning when he noticed handprints very low on all of the glass doors in the hallway. He grabs some Windex and a squeegee and comes back to the area. He crouches down to clean up the mess when he feels a cold like the most bitter winter night passed straight through him. He took two days sick leave and refused to clean a window after that. The head of HR worked late and was arming the security system when the system notified her that a door was open and she needed to close it before arming. This door was on the roof. She climbs the stairs, closes the door and on her climb down, she hears strange sounds coming from the fabrication area on the second floor. It was a radio. She couldn't see it in the darkness, but she could hear a radio panning through stations by itself. She took it out of there. I stayed very late one weekend, operating a CNC lathe and around midnight, I started to feel very watched. I didn't feel alone at all, but I tried to ignore it because I still had four more hours of part run time. Sitting at a desk, I suddenly felt as though someone was right the fuck behind me. I turn around and freeze in absolute terror. There was nothing physically there, but all my senses told me there was something inches from my face. The breeze from the factory air system faltered and the general din of a facility with many large machines was muffled. It was like I put my face right up to a glass wall. I punched the big red emergency stop button on the lathe and I booked out of that place as fast as my ass could go. This happened around 10 years ago when I was still in high school. My friend's family had a cabin at a beach community. It was a gated community, so there were numerous cabins, a pool, a mini shop, and lighted paths that would lead to the beach. We went numerous times to spend the night there. It was a big property, so we decided to play a game. Team A starts at the beginning of the complex, while Team B has to scare them somewhere along the route. It was around 2 to 4 a.m. Not quite sure what the time was. We really wanted to stay up all night just because we were high schoolers, I guess. It sounds like a stupid game, but oh well. We split up into two groups. Four of us would hide and three of us would make the trek down the community to get to the beach. The first round went pretty smooth, nothing out of the ordinary. But the second time was when things got creepy. It was my group's turn to scare the team walking down, so we hid close to a couple of parked cars. Next thing, we received a phone call from one of the searchers, and this is how it went. Them. We see you guys. Come out. It's our turn. Us. N no, you don't. We don't see anyone near us. Okay, jump. We thought it was a trick to make us expose ourselves, so we didn't jump. We see you. You jumped. Do a squat. Once again, we didn't follow the directions. Yep, it's you. 
We see you. Come out. We haven't done anything. Where are you? By the pools. We're nowhere near the pools. We're by the parked cars. We met up with them, and they said how a dark, shadowy figure was where they thought we were, hiding behind a pool chair. At first it was crouched down, somewhat hidden. But as our friends called us over the phone and told us what to do, this thing perfectly followed their requests. They weren't close enough to hear that a regular person could have heard them speak. Additionally, the entire night we didn't see another person there with us. Who else would jump and squat on command? Both groups booked it back to the cabin. We're also sure that they're telling the truth because they didn't want to leave the cabin the same night. We asked them multiple times after as well, and all of them supported their stories. My cousin and I were kids last time. I was in the neighborhood. We were chasing each other with marshmallow guns. It was hilarious. He shot a marshmallow into my mouth because I was laughing at him so hard. Well, anyway, we came across this cool looking mailbox kind of thing and we decided to go look at it. I'm not sure what year this was exactly, but we only had three Harry Potter films at the time and camera phones were not that great quality. We open the mailbox and we find that it's just got candles in it. Cousin looks at me. He asks why there's candles in this things and what is it? I say I don't know. Next thing we know, we hear this evil sounding laughter. Like this would make a comic book villain run. We thought it was his older sister just messing with us. We turn around and there's nobody there. A raggedy Ann doll is waving at us and starts running at us. My cousin and I ran like hell back to his house. He's in tears and I'm covered in sweat. Our parents ask us what's wrong. I'm not about to tell my folks that a doll ran me off. Cousin tells his parents and then they come in to talk to me. I was a known prankster, so I thought that they were going to accuse me of messing with their kid. Instead, they asked me about the box. I told them that we were at that thing and the candles weren't lit. They nod their heads. They talk to each other in Spanish and then they tell my mom and stepdad. The four adults nod their heads at me. This mailbox was pretty much a Catholic shrine that must be lit daily or else stuff like what happened to my cousin and I would have to more often. Fast forward to 2019, I have to go back to that neighborhood for a food order. The shrine was lit, but I still felt like I had crossed into some strange other place. 